Have a good day, everyone, no matter where, where you are. Probably for some people will be good morning, for other people will be good afternoon. So we are happy to welcome you to the new webinars of the series uh, of the uh, IAU and UOC uh, in the transformation of uh, universities and in shaping uh, the, the new future. Uh, today we have a very interesting, uh, interesting webinar uh, on the topic of interaction and collaboration, being social in online spaces. You know that usually online, educa online education or in general digital education is sometimes criticized because some consider that maybe there are no spaces for collaboration and for social interaction in these digital environments. I don't think this is true. So I, I think that we can have a lot of evidence that it happens in a different way. And today we have two people that will help us to show you evidence on that particular issue. So on one hand, we have uh, Shanali Govander from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And on the other hand, we will have also Monsignor from the Open University of Catalonia. <clears throat> I'm going to give the floor to, to Shanali Govender to start this, this, uh, this session today. We will have between 15 and 20 minutes each as their presentations, and later we will have some time for questions and answers. So please, from the very beginning, if you have any questions, please uh, put them into the chat, and later in the time for questions and answers, we will retrieve these questions and we will ask them to our uh, in BTS. Okay, so uh, let me introduce Shanali. Shanali is based, as I said, in the University of Cape Town, and she is a, a staff a development practitioner and lecturer at the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching, and uh, she's teaching in the postgraduate diploma in educational technologies. That is something that I have liked very much when I read their particular presentation. And, and, and it's that she says that no day is ever the same. What a beautiful way to work for everyone. So uh, in that sense, uh, Shanali is working with the staff uh, to strengthen and expand their teaching practices through individual engagement. And she works um, to across all the university, sometimes in engineering course, other in a performance course. So it means that uh, she's always feel in spirit, inspired by uh, to learn, to keep up with the needs of their colleagues and the students and driven by the idea of creating opportunities of learning uh, that are exciting, relevant, relevant and accessible for everyone. So from this perspective, she's going to tell us about the, uh, his, her experience on the interaction and collaboration and their social uh, in, in impact. Please, Shanali, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. And thank you again for the invitation to join everyone today. Um, I am just going to share my screen. Um, and hopefully colleagues, you will be able to, to see that. Yeah? Great, thank you very much. So, I'm going to be chatting today actually about the first part of, of the, the webinar. So, um, or the first part of the title of the webinar around interaction rather than collaboration. And Monse is gonna take over and chat about the collaboration so that we hope that our two presentations today will complement each other. Um, and so thank you again for the invite. I'm based as, as um, Albert said, at the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching. The University of Cape Town and I'm not sure how many people in the room are familiar with the city of Cape Town and so I thought that I would start by showing you a little bit of the space in which I work. Um, so a little bit in my context, uh, about 15 minutes from my house there is this very beautiful seafront area, beautiful parks, lovely very very expensive real estate, um, quite an expensive part of the city to live in. So if you go 15 minutes in one way, you will find this kind of life. If you go 15 minutes in the other direction, you will find a very different kind of life. 
In fact, if you fly into the city of Cape Town, your first introduction to the city will be flying over housing of the kind that you see on your screen at the moment. And you will notice the comparison is very clear and very stark. Um, in, in the picture that's in front of you at the moment, you'll notice that the houses are very close. There are no public spaces that are green or beautiful or safe, in fact, necessarily always for children. Um, and then I thought I'd show you some classrooms. So big picture, zooming in a little bit. This is my classroom um, when I teach my online learning design course. And you will notice that everybody sitting in that room has a device in front of them. Um, they also have a device in their pockets and some of them have another one on their wrists. So in this classroom, there are often as many as two devices or three devices per person in the room. Um, and that is in stark contrast to the next classroom that I'm going to show you, which is of a historically disadvantaged school in a rural area in South Africa, where even the very basic amenities of learning, um, adequate sanitation facilities, textbooks, just space to kind of stretch your arms a little bit um, are not available to you. And they are definitely minimal digital spaces and devices. So the reason I started with this is because I wanted to just say to you that my presentation today comes from a space where I live in a highly unequal society. The students who join us at the University of Cape Town typically come from spaces that are as diverse as the ones that I have shown you today. So they come from classrooms where there are Google Classrooms um, and literally everything in the school is networked all the way to students who I've had students say to me, actually, I've never touched a keyboard. I had one student who had physically never put her hands on a keyboard in her life. And so our topic for today, this idea of interaction and collaboration and digital environments, I wanted to start by saying that my environment is very, is very diverse and very polarized in some ways. And what I would encourage people to do if they would like to is pop into the text chat and just leave a couple of messages for me because I'm watching the text chat on the side about how you would describe your environment that your students come into and that your students come from. So what is your teaching and learning environment like? And feel free to do that as, as we chat and as we continue today. So into this highly unequal and diverse and, and polarized society, we have a problem, and I think this is a, a problem in the South African context, but I think it is also a problem in many cases in the global context, and that is that many people feel disconnected, and we feel disconnected for a whole lot of reasons. Um, consequences of, of different kinds of technology being in our lives, consequences of mobility, children live far from their parents, uh, family units are structured in a wide variety of ways that are sometimes supportive and caring and loving, and sometimes very difficult. We work a lot. Certainly in South African society, we probably work too much. Um, and the whole COVID situation and pandemic as it unfolded in our context where there was a very hard lockdown, there was no social or very minimal social interactions. And you couldn't, at one point you were allowed outside your house for one hour a day. Um, so COVID made it a lot worse, that idea of disconnection. And then again, in our context, higher education for our students is often very alienating. They are first, first time uh, attenders of a higher, higher education uh, learning. They may be the first in their families very often. And so this makes it for them a very disconnected and alienating process. And so overcoming that sense of disconnection through enabling interaction, through enabling collaboration is absolutely critical to the success of our students in our higher education context. So we care deeply if our students engage socially. And part of that is because there is an undisputable link between belonging and success. In the literature, it's firmly established that if we think of success as retention, keeping your students in, in higher education, and achievement and satisfaction. If we think of success as those three things, 
then there is an incredibly strong association between social engagement and whether our students feel like they belong and want to stay in higher education. There's an equally strong association between academic engagement and belonging and retention. So if we want them to feel like they belong, if we want them to stay studying, um, to stay in their courses, to succeed, to, to exit their courses with a qualification, academic and social engagement must go hand in hand. The other thing that the literature tells us and our experiences I'm sure also tell us is that for non-traditional students, whether non-traditional means first and family, or whether it means coming from a particular linguistic group or a particular gender or class group, for non-traditional students, that sense of belonging is even more important. And so part of the reason that we care so deeply about helping our students to engage socially is for many of our students, the experience of coming to university, learning at university is not a transition. It's not a smooth step from, from secondary school to, to university. It's more of a transplantation. Somebody kind of grabs them and whips them out of their homes, out of perhaps a Zulu speaking environment, a also speaking environment and transplants them to a space where somebody said to me once, I hear more Italian on the bus than I hear Zulu. And for them, that's a huge uh, and traumatic transplantation. The kind of food they eat in the residences is different from what you might eat at home. The way people dress might be different. Uh, for many of our students, the first time that they encounter somebody of a different religion, a different ethnicity, a different class is actually at university. And so it's a huge transplantation. And so they are even more, again, alienated and disengaged. In addition to this, as you would have guessed from those pictures in my earlier comments, students' prior digital experiences are simply not equal. As I said, Google School versus never having touched a keyboard. And even when they do have those experiences, those experiences are not always helpful for learning and teaching, for developing the kinds of social interactions that will support student learning. So I have four prompts that I want to share today. The first one is this idea of what kinds of social experience are we trying to create online? And I'm gonna share the prompts and then for each prompt, I'm also going to share um, a few examples of from our context of how this happened and how we worked on this. So what kinds of social are we trying to create online? And then what kinds of places are we trying to create online? What do we need to do and be as educators, as lecturers, as teachers, as academics? What do we need to do and be to create and sustain those spaces for our students? And then how do we move these spaces towards equity? So as we think about how do I design social spaces for my learners in higher education, these are the ideas, these are the prompts that I think are practical and useful for us to think about. I've also sort of pitched today's session at what we might do as individual lecturers. There are things that our institutions might do, but sometimes that's out of the scope of our individual control. So for today, we're sticking at the level of in my course, in my kind of sphere of influence, what can I do? So prompt number one is what kinds of social are we trying to create online? And I find that it can be quite helpful to think of metaphors. So for yourself, take a moment and think about the idea of the social space you would want to create for your students in and around your course and try and answer the question, the social space I'm trying to create is like. Take a moment, what is that like? What does it feel like to you? What's the closest experience you can compare it to? And scribble that down or add it to the text chat. I'd love to hear some of the ideas there. But I'm going to offer a couple of prompts or a couple of suggestions for that. So what are the kinds of social we're trying to create online? We might be trying to create spaces that feel like a celebration to our students. Spaces that feel like there's something to be excited about, that there's something to enjoy. We might be trying to create a social space for our students that feels a little bit more like a marketplace a place where you go when you need something, there's an exchange involved. Uh, perhaps you, you go there when 
you want to say to someone, uh, has somebody got some notes from the last lecture that I need to, that I could look at, or has somebody got any suggestions for how to do this or that or the other? So kind of an exchange space. You might want to create social spaces that are a little bit more like a spiritual home for your students, a space for comfort, a space for community, a space for inspiration, a space to kind of set yourself straight when you need that moment. Or social spaces that are problem solving where students would gather together. And I think that's what Monse is gonna get into in a bit more detail is where students would gather together and problem solve and collaborate together. Or social spaces that are fundamentally spaces for intimacy. So not about celebration, not about like big and out there, but spaces where students can find connections that sustain them. So as we're thinking about what are the different kinds of spaces that I might create for my students? What are the different kind of feel of those spaces? We should hold on to that as we design. We should hold on to that as we plan. And we might want to think about pulling together more than one of those spaces. So a couple of different kinds of spaces, a space where students can, can have an intimate moment with one other person, where they can have a breakout room that they can join and just connect with one person, um, or have a chat space where anyone can drop in a message at any time. So all of those are things that we might want to consider. So let's move on to my second prompt. So if the first prompt was about what kind of social do we want to create, the second prompt for me is what kind of places am I trying to create online? Um, and it, it draws on the idea that place is a kind of mediated aggregate of the people and a, a range of forces, so of actors and forces, that in fact, place is a collaborator in our engagements with our students, in their engagements with each other. And so I'm going to suggest that there are three categories, let's call it, of places that we're trying to create. And this really answers the question about how much are we involved in the place? How much do we structure it? How much do we control it? So let's look at those three and I'm gonna give you some examples for each of them. So the first is an example of a kind of a managed social space. For us, for many of our students, they don't know each other when they first come to university. In fact, we have students who arrive in Cape Town on a bus, having traveled for sort of 20 odd hours and they don't know a single person in the city. They have never been there. Their families have never been there. It's totally new. And so one of our roles in the institution is to help our students just to find friends, actually, um, in a space where often they may not, at the moment especially, be seeing each other. Or, as is the case with this particular class, they're scattered all over the country and are joining us online. And so an example of a managed space would be any digital space in your LMS or even outside of your LMS where your students have an opportunity in a very structured way to get to know each other and to get to interact with each other. So a simple example is the one that I've got on the screen at the moment. This is a class of about 30 students, comes from all over Africa. And we start them off the week before the class starts with a very simple introduce yourself activity. So they get onto the LMS, they get onto the Padlet, they have to add a picture or a video or a voice note of themselves. We encourage them to add a picture and a video. And then we ask them on top of that to just tell us a little bit about themselves. So there's an example of a managed social space. Let's talk about some facilitated social spaces. And I've got three examples on the screen in front of you. We all use Zoom rooms. But what would happen if at the beginning of our classes, instead of start jumping straight in with the content, we gave our students a few minutes to go into breakaways. Everybody goes into a breakaway with one or two other people and they have to share the answer to some very personal and innocuous question. So something that sparks joy, something that made you angry this week, something that made you happy this week, something that you're looking forward to in the weekend. And you cycle through that activity two or three times before you start talking about engineering or maths or science or whatever it is that we're doing that day. And that's called a, it's called different things in the literature. You can call it a mad 
uh, Mad Hatter's party or a wild tea, but the idea is to give students a chance to connect with each other. There's an, an activity like a visual check-in where you get students to simply indicate how am I feeling using an emoticon and then perhaps have a conversation about it afterwards. In the spaces in which we work, we also often use something like spiral journals, which are an opportunity for people to connect with themselves first. The questions are very much about how you are before moving on to connect with other people. And these are all examples of facilitated spaces. For me, they are a little bit more open than the um, managed space, but it still gives students something of a structure. Of course, we've got lots and lots of open spaces that students can engage in. So a space like Twitter with a course hashtag can be a really useful space for students to engage with each other and find each other. In the context of my institution, students all always start their own WhatsApp groups. There will be a course WhatsApp group and they will join that and participate in that, but there's always a back channel. And that's something that we can enable and encourage actually as a way for them to, to engage with each other. And then increasingly over the last year, people have seen students doing things like starting Discord servers for their courses as a space to engage with each other as peers. And in some cases, staff have been invited on for specific sessions, they've stepped out, they've gone back in again. All of these things are opportunities to engage openly or for our students to engage openly with each other. And that brings me to prompt number three. What is it that educators need to do or be to create these spaces? So the first thing that I want to just highlight is that it means moving between the technical and the social as an educator. As an educator, as Julie Salmon suggests in, in her work of the last almost 20 years now, um, educators need to be skilled in helping students to navigate the technical obstacles to participation as well as the social obstacles. So helping them access the system, as Salmon says here, is accompanied by activities that welcome and encourage. Getting students just to send that first message, participate in that first forum, is also accompanied by building bridges between cultural, social, and learning environments. So that's the first thing that we need to do as educators. We need to be actually experts in moving between the technical and the social. The next thing that we might want to consider being is we might want to consider what it means to be intentionally equitable hosts. So we might want to consider what it means to welcome every participant, paying careful attention to who might be excluded when our design doesn't work for certain people. The third thing that we might want to do, and this is perhaps in some ways the hardest thing for many of us, is we might want to allow ourselves to be seen by our students. So we might need to engage in an act of intellectual bravery where we show up as ourselves, good hair days, bad hair days, et cetera, in order to show our students that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to not be perfect. And that would encourage them to step more fully into the spaces that they are in as well. And then the fourth prompt that I wanna suggest for today is how do we move these spaces towards equity, and justice. I think equality is something that we, we've worked in a while, but equity and justice are the two things that I'm interested in. So we have this plethora of equity concerns in the world in which we live, and I'm not going to stay with those for long. We'll share the slides afterwards for anyone who wants to dip into that. But I want to offer instead the work of Maha Bali, who suggests that we might consider at these different levels, at the level of course philosophy, design, and planning, at the level of our habitual practices, how we respond to specific situations and how we interact individually with our students. We might consider how we design our social spaces with that in mind. So how do we create multilingual spaces? How do we create spaces where the tacit expectations of how to interact are made absolutely clear and therefore the space is more visible to everybody who interacts in it. And I think I'm going to pause at that point because I think that's me just over. Albert, is that okay time-wise? Thank you very Good. much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Hanali, because it has been uh, just, uh, just in time. 
and and I think this is uh, okay. So, and especially thank you very much for your inspiring speech because I think that you have provided a lot of ideas uh, and a lot of questions at the same time. So probably people can engage later uh, in order to ask questions or make comments. Remember that you can uh, get into the chat and ask a question or put a comment, post a comment, and later at the end of the two. Uh, uh, presentations, we will open a uh, space <laughs> in order to uh, discuss uh, with each other. So thank you very much. And, and now uh, I would only like first to, to introduce our, um, our next uh, invited uh, professor. I would like to remember you that this is the fifth uh, session in this uh, Innovative Education for Chef Futures uh, webinar series that have been organized by the International Association of Universities and the Open University of Catalonia. The last one, the sixth and last one, will be next October 14 at 2.30 p.m. Uh, so in, in Central European time, you will be more than welcome to the last uh, speech too. I will remember, remind you that at the end of our session. Now, let me introduce uh, Professor Monse Guiter from the Open University of Catalonia. Uh, she is main researcher at the EduLab Research Group on ICT and Education. Uh, she's got a PhD in Educational Sciences from the University of Barcelona, and uh, she specializes in new technologies. And she's all, she also has a degree in education at, at the same university. From its beginnings in 1995, he has been a lecturer at the Open University of Catalonia uh, on the studies of psychology uh, and educational sciences, and especially in the area of digital competence, competence as well as in the Master of Education and ICT e-learning. Uh, her research focuses on the use of ICT in education and training, and particularly in online collaboration, online teacher training, and digital competences. She has coordinated some projects in these areas, uh, both nationally and internationally, and has published several articles and participated in international conferences and workshops in these research areas. Uh, in addition, she has received, she has been uh, awarded with the Jaume Vicens Vives 2016 distinction uh, from the government of Catalonia for the leadership in online training and digital skills in the university environments and its impact on citizens. I also proud also to be one of the, of her closer colleagues at the university. And today she's going to talk about design and strategies for interaction and collaboration in online scenarios. So uh, further on the presentation of Professor Govender uh, first, uh, now we are going into uh, a, a much more um, uh, specialized or, or particular way in order to design these spaces and places that uh, Shanali Govender uh, uh, mentioned. So please, Monse, the floor is yours. Thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you to invite me in this webinar. I think you can see the presentation. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you, Shanili, about your presentation. It's very complementary to my presentation, as Albert said. My presentation is about design and strategy for collaboration in online scenarios. And I start to talk about the digital transformation. Digital transformation is coming. And the COVID, it was an accelerator of this digital transformation. But, sorry. But um, what did COVID show us? The pandemic situation, it have experienced to provide different evidence for the digital transformation. The first one is the there is a significant digital divide. Um, in order to develop our cell and digital scenarios, we need acquired digital competence. It demonstrates also the importance of connectivity and need of interaction. The difficulty how to manage the time in digital scenarios. The obsession of synchrony 
And also, it made clear the potential on offline collaboration thanks to the tools they can help us to interact and work together. When we talk about the digital divide, we consider usually only the access. But there are three dimensions of digital divide. Access, use, intensity of use, and also the quality of the use and all contexts of life, professional, social, economic way. Considering the relevance of digital technology and overcome digital divide, we need to be digital competence. And now it's important, but what we define the digital competence, digital competence is not only to know the technologies, it's more than this. The European Commission de define the digital technologies as a set of knowledge, skills, attitudes, strategies, which are required when you use the digital technology for different tasks for communication, management information, collaborate, create content, build knowledge. But how? In an effective, efficient, adequate, critical, creative, autonomous, flexible, ethical, and sensible way. For, for what? For work, entertainment, participation, learning, socialization, consumption, and empowerment. Now we know what is the digital competence, and now I'm going to talk what happened in the new form on relationship. In digital scenarios cannot reproduce what we do in the face-to-face -face scenarios. We have to consider new ways of relationship, working, and learning. Now, thanks to digital technology, we can connect and interact anytime, anyone, anywhere with people around the world. And how to manage the time? In digital scenarios, the concept of time are different. We need to measure world lives, leave space for break, and also establishing flexible routines. For example, if you telework, you have to stop frequently to move and to make some physical exercise, you cannot sit in front of the screen now, right now more than two hours non-stop. In the pandemic, also, the obsession of singleness become evidence and you need to consider, sorry, and you need to consider the potential of the asynchronous. The asynchronous, it explains and makes time more flexible Synchrony can be combined with the asynchronous and is necessary to reinforce synchronous for that situation that add value. For example, manage emotions and so on. Online collaboration is possible thanks to digital technology. It seems easy, easy but is to do properly, you need to create a culture of collaboration to acquire organization and planning strategies and to acquire communication strategies. Now, I will talk about online collaboration, design and strategies, but in order to perform online and hybrid collaboration in academic scenarios, it's necessary to design and plan some strategies. These strategies will help us to apply efficiently and effectively the online collaboration. But what is online collaboration? Online collaboration is based on a process of activity, interaction, and reciprocity among a group of people facilitating the joint construction of a common goal based on individual work. It is shared, coordinate, and interdependent process which people were using online collaborative tools in order to achieve a common goal. When we know what is online collaboration, let's to know that collaboration have different levels of collaboration. You can see in this graph, in one axis, the collaboration on the degree of a structure of 
complexity and activity to perform. And the other axis, you can see the number of people involved in this activity. Let's, let's to see some examples. For example, in virtual discussion is in the bottom, in the middle of the graphic because you don't have a very structured activities. And if you go to digital project, you can see it in the top right of the graphic because you need a complexity activity and with a small group of people. Later, I will put some example about this. Now we talk, when we talk about collaboration during my presentation, I will situate in online the part of online. If you see in the online and the asynchronous collaboration, if you can see this continuum, but all that I will explain can be also applied in collaboration, in hybrid, and also in face-to-face -face scenarios. When we can talk about collaboration, research has shown there are four critical processes critical or important process. Critical because you need to know this process. The first one is the creation of collaborative culture. Each member has to clearly understand that they work for a common goal. Each member is a key piece. Each member need to develop individual and group work. And they need to show attitudes, such as trust, respect, tolerance, and so on. The second is communication. During any process of online collaboration, communication becomes the axis. Without communication, there is not collaboration. For this reason, the communication must be participatory and periodic, respect, respectful and positive, concise and clear, to be present the net et etiquette is the rule of the applying internet and take advantage of synchrony for to be more flexible. The third point is the organization and planning. The organization and planning are more important when it is developed in a face-to-face -face scenario. We need to define the rules of operation and also make the distribution of the roles, planning and also replanning during the process. I finally to organize of information in a clear and transparent way. Finally, assessment and evaluation. It's important to analyze the personal work, appreciate the work for the classmate, evidence the process and the results, and finally reflect what has been learned with this collaboration. Now, in this process is important the role of the teacher in collaboration. And the role of the teacher is not only during the design stage, but also in the implementation with the application the strategies. During the design plan stage, it's necessary to make decisions based on the following questions. Is the nature of the activity is coherent with the collaboration? Is the collaboration a competence or a methodology? What level of collaboration you define? As we explained before, how should group the students, teacher or student? How long is learning collaboration activity? One week, one semester, one month, and so on. Regarding the assessment, how is it carry out the assessment? Continuous assessment or final assessment? Assessment of the process or assessment of the results? Will the students play active role during the evaluation process? Will the students carry out self-assessment, peer assessment or co-assessment activities? Which instrument can be used? Do you use learning analytics? What type of collaboration tools or resources do you select? Open, private, open resource, personal resource. During the implementation stage, what strategies does the teacher apply? Encourage person and group autonomy, reinforce attitudes, motivate collaboration, follow up the collaboration, manage conflicts, manage individual work versus teamwork empower digital competence for students, evaluation and closing, individual and group feedback, individual and team assessment makers. Well, 
This is the role of the teacher in design the online collaboration activities. Now, I don't know what happened. Now, we present some activities to facilitate the critical process of online collaboration. The first critical process is creating a collaborative culture. We talk about the social dimension. One example of activity is, can be a virtual discussion about the case of online collaboration. With this activity, the students reflect about the relevance of working for a common goal, making attitudes explicit, and also potential the online asynchronous communication. Another activity is defined a group name. It facilitates the creation of their own identity, and it is very important for the consolidate the group and develop the future teamwork. The second critical process is communication, Part participatory, civic, and efficient. During teamwork, is very important the communication and for this reason is important to define the rule of the communication as a team but also is important to know the potential of the synchronous and the asynchronous communication asynchronous communication is more for reflect task and knowledge creation and is more flexible and synchronous communication facilitates decision and makes um, easy consent the third point is about organization and planning is also very important and we need to design specific activities for example the students can create the agreement rules for the group in base of availability rules of each participant conflict management select tools allocate tasks information management and so on and it's very useful and necessary to make group planning in and replanning during the process Finally, the four is the continuum assessment. In the continuum assessment, the, the role for the student is important to be active. For this, I propose four activities, self-assessment, co-assessment, group reflex of collaboration process, and also um, peer assessment or assessment of the other group. And during the process, the role of the teacher it will accompany the developing of these activities. And the role of these activities will be continuous assessment for the process and for the result, the individual and group feedback, the individual qualification, and so on. All these are the activities that we can help to, to be more collaboration effective and efficient. Here, uh, to finish this section, I will provide two examples of online collaboration activities. The first one is very common in online education, the virtual discussion. And if you see in the virtual discussion, the teacher role is um, designer, moderator, and evaluator. During the design studies, the teacher needs to define the objective of the activity, select and create the resource. You can see here and guide about discussion, planning of the time, requirement of intervention, create, create a folder organization. You can see here also define the role of the teacher and define the assessment criteria. During the devel development stage, the teachers develop the role of a, a moderator, as Albert said now. Finally, during the closing of the activity, they conclude the discussion and also they can make the assessment for the student and they can use the information provided by the learning analytics. The other example is an online collaborative project. This example is taken from the work course called ICT Competence, and the students acquire the digital competence with this compulsory course that present in all undergraduate of the program at the work. The course guaranteed a series of open educational resources in different format, and the methodology of the course, if you can see here, is based on project learning with change-based learning approach, and the student have an active role. And also they have an active role in the assessment process, co-assessment and self-assessment. To conclude in this presentation, I want to make a, a 
systematize of the benefits of the online collaboration. First for the teachers and second for the students. For the teacher facilitates the innovation, improving practice, it provides the social dimension and reflective practice. All these help them to create a community of practice. Here you see the small commun virtual community of the students, of the teachers at the work. For the students, the students emphasize the students' participation and active role, encourage active knowledge construction, promote the acquisition of competence, involve and motivate the students, and in a online environment is very important promote the social dimension by reducing the isolate. Now I want to finalize this presentation by the Decalogue about the online collaboration. Um, the first one is awareness of collaboration, common goal and attitude. Second, explain process and register evidence. Third, importance of individual work for group work. The fourth is collaboration takes time. Five is define agreements, rules and operation. Six, develop a plan and review. Seven, participatory, civic and efficient communication. Eight, agile management and good organization of information. Nine, use the most appropriate tools in each situation and then participate in the assessment evaluation process. I think with this, ten, this decalogue, I summarize the principal ideas. If you want to make an online collaboration activity with the student, you need to be these all 10 ideas. Thank you very much. And I hope I go on time. Thank you very much, Monse. Yes, you were perfectly on time. So I would like to thank you both uh, for being so strict. I know that sometimes one speeds up uh, the presentation uh, in order to be able to, 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 to say whatever we would like to say, even if our time is short for that. But anyway, thank you very much. I think that you both uh, presentations have been very clear in that sense. And now we are going to start with some questions. In fact, I would like to summarize something like I think it's important. We have started talking about, especially about social, and we're finishing to talking about collaboration or collaborative. But it doesn't mean uh, two different things. So social and collaborative are two sides of the same coin. So it's important always to take into consideration that collaboration is only possible if we create social spaces as uh, um, Shanali said at the very beginning. Okay, so we have some questions now. Uh, let me have a look on, on, on the list of questions we have here. Uh, we have a first question that it's addressed to Shanali. Shanali, please. Uh, said uh, facilitating social space has been a challenge in a, multi um, in a multicultural society like South Africa, where students are not open to one another. How do you encourage universities to bring multicultural students together? Thank you very much for that question. Um, so the first thing that I want to suggest that we, we have to consider is we have to consider co-creating a culture of communication that's relevant to teaching and learning in the digital space. Our students have very well established cultures of communication for digital, uh, for digital communication that's about their social lives. That is about perhaps almost like a, a passing conversation with somebody. Now you yell at somebody on Twitter because they make you angry and then you never have to talk to them again and you never have to engage with them again. Um, and I think, so for me, the first thing is to co-create a productive culture for communication. And that means a whole lot of things. That means acknowledging the positions that we bring to that and the positionalities that we bring to that, the identities we bring to that. Um, acknowledging the context in which our students are having those conversations. 
uh, in, in the South African context, you simply can't talk about anything in our country without also acknowledging issues around race and, and financial inequality. And so having those things on the table, understanding that's going to shape our conversations is critical. I'd also suggest that part of what you have to have is you have to have a shared communal purpose in that conversation. Asking people to communicate and engage with each other without some sense of why are we in this together is for me something that, that will be a fruitless exercise. So first, why are we in this together? Or part of the first. As I've sort of hinted at, I think that many of our behaviors around the online, around learning online, are cultivated in other spaces and we, we bring those into learning and teaching. And so helping our students to define and to practice, what does it mean to have a teaching and learning conversation online? What does it mean to have a conversation between two students where you learn from each other, as opposed to where you fight with each other and then go away again? Um, I think is really critical to help people to practice that. What does it look like? What does it sound like? How do we put those words together? And then helping students to move from conversations that are low risk, What's your favorite music? What's your favorite meal? What does your mom cook on a Sunday? To high risk conversations. How do, I, how do I express my gender identity? What do we do with land in South Africa? So helping people to, to, to move from safer spaces to more bold spaces is I think really important as well. So those would be some of my kind of, my principles that I would want to hold on to when I'm thinking about helping people who come from disparate positions to conversation. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the lovely question. Thank you, Shana Lee. Uh, the, the, the following question is for Monse. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone asks us about when do you evaluate the effectiveness of collaboration in online learning? During sessions? or at the end of the program? Okay. Um, I, I think I told, we evaluate um, in the continuous um, process. It, we evaluate the process and also the results. Usually, we, we have information about the system because the student work with the tools and we have information about the system with the learning analytics or with the information that you have in the system. And you can see in the space, in the common space, the activity of a student. And we evaluate the process with, um, with this information about the space and you can see what the students do and also the result. And the final, Mm, qualification of the student is we cross the result for the group and also the activity during the process. I think this is the answer. You need more information? So. I think that it's enough for now. So if, if, if the person who asked the question would like to add something else, uh, he or she could do it in the in the chat and we will retrieve the question again. So I, I will go on with you, Monse, because mm -hmm. uh, there is a couple of questions that are asking yes. something similar. Uh, and maybe later I will also ask Shanali to, to, to give uh, her opinion on that. But said, uh, I would like to know what are the critical points that we have to keep in mind, whether we want to transform face-to-face -face teaching into a hybrid system and in which students could work synchronically while the rest of students are working face to face. In other words, it's what is the key to ensuring student engagement in a very basic hybrid classroom where half of the class is in class and the another half attends online simultaneously. Okay, <laughs> difficult question. No, not difficult because when I explain, we have a continuum face to face and online. If you put in the online situation, you can use the same, the same key elements for the whole continuum. Why? For example, when we talk with the teacher, face to face teacher, when we work in online situation and they know these four key elements, they use these activities that I, that I explained to you 
in the online, the use in the face to face. Usually, when we organize the group, we don't think about the identity of the group. And this is very important. And if you create an activity with put the name of the group, the students create the identity of the group. And this is the same in online that in face to face. And also another activity, for example, to make the rules for the group or to define the strategies of communication. It's very important. Usually when we start to work face to face, you start working and someone talk, talk a lot, the other one don't talk and so on. If you define or you describe a rules for communication, it's easy to work better in collaboration. And for this, for me, it's important these activities and these key elements are the same in the face to face than in the collab online collaboration. But in online are more necessary. But if you are apply this in the face to face, it will be OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So I think that this is a starting point of discussion. Of course, this discussion could be longer because it's not easy to to answer this uh, very important and complicated question. Uh, Kanali, uh, as teachers, we are able to present the content of the subjects effectively and efficiently. But what do we need to do for imparting values so as to shape the character of the students? That's a very interesting question. So I'm not convinced that values are something that can be imparted like a cup of tea. Um, I think that our values are something that we develop and we test over time. Um, and so simply showing them to our students or telling our students about them is never going to make an honest or a courageous or a, um, you know, a, 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 a hospitable or, or anti-racist human being. Um, I believe that what we have to do is we have to give our students opportunities to test their values, to talk about their values with other people and to have an opportunity to experience how their values impact on others. So if I choose not to be honest about something, if I, if I choose to, to steal something, what is the consequence of that? And so for me, it's a question of conversation, connection, discussion, it's a question of testing that in real life. And then it's a question of reflection. Sitting with those conversations, with those experiences and going, is this the kind of human I want to be? And how do I change who I am as a person deep inside? But I, I am not convinced that we can transmit them. We might model them. We might show our students what it's like to be brave when you're terrified. Uh, we might show our students what it's like to be honest when you're terrified. Um, but I don't think that we can transmit them as easily as a cup of tea, no. So, but thanks, Albert. Thank you very much. Uh, we are, unfortunately, we are reaching at the end of this uh, journey today. And there is still one question uh, I would like to ask you uh, to, 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 to answer very brief, both of you. So some people still expect the same type of communication as offline physical communication. That rapport still cannot be bridged with online communication, much less collaboration with unknown members online. How can this be overcome? <laughs> what would you like to ask uh, to answer first? Yes. <laughs> well, um... very short, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um... Sorry, you can summarize the question, Albert, please. So uh, people expect uh, that in an online setting, communication should be the same as in a physical setting. So uh, as online communication is a, a bit different and could convey less co co collaboration because members online could not know each other, how we can be this overcome. I was thinking that maybe uh, considering that online has not to be like face to face. I think um, 
it's different. And for this, the students need to know um, why is different because um, we don't know the synchrony uh, like now we don't need to stay all together talking and collaboration we can make collaboration uh, in a flexible way we need to have a very good rules about common collaboration it's usually if you write a message you need to be more prudent about the expression and so on because if you talk like now about the hands and so on you can understand more me and for this the communication is different and the students need to know why it's different uh, and what kind of communication is better in in different moments no? thank you uh, uh would you like to add something else i would so, so my kind of hope for it is I'm a reader. I love to read. I read books on a page and I weep or I laugh or I get excited. And those are just words about characters that don't even exist. I, I believe that when we engage online, we are reading somebody's words on a screen. But my job is to imagine who's on the other side. My my exercise is an exercise of empathy and of compassion and imagination. And when, when we fail to communicate with each other in online spaces, we're failing to imagine and to empathize with who's on the other side. And I don't think that those are failures that only happen in the online. I think they happen in the face-to-face -face as well. The online just shines a spotlight on it. And so I would like to suggest that while it is not easy necessarily to read a book and weep for a character. We've all had that experience. We've all watched a movie, we've been in tears. It's not real, it's just somebody way over there in the online space. We can exercise that same empathy and that same imagination with our students and our students with each other. We just have to reach for it. Thank you very much. I think that this has been a, a clear answer to the question that our audience asked for, for having a, an answer. Okay, so uh, it's time to finish. Unfortunately, I would like to thank you very much, Shanali Governor, University of Cape Town, South Africa, Monse Guiter, Open University of Catalonia, Spain, for your collaboration in this webinar series. It's been a pleasure for us to, to, to have you here. And I would also like to, to thank you uh, a couple of people also collaborating, in particularly in this uh, in this uh, session, Andrea Tavernero from UOC uh, with the questions, and also Tina Jensen from IAU, that which we we are working together in all these webinar series with a lot of pleasure for that. So I, I would like to finish this saying that there is another question about if there is any other any experience working on a virtual exchange program. It's good if someone had, uh, uh, has asked this question because it means that during the session, people have been aware about the fact that online we can do a lot of things and we can exchange multiculturally a lot of experiences. I, I cannot say an, a, a name at this moment. I can say that in Europe, there is the virtual Erasmus program in which different people can move online from one institution to other. There are several programs that also accept students from other universities that can participate even from home online. So it's something that we should explore and, and develop much more. So for sure, if you look for it, you, you will find some experiences. So finally, just remind you that next October 14, uh, 2.30, uh, Central European time, data governance. What should we be aware of? With another two experts that will share their, their visions on that particular topic. Please, you will be very welcome to come to that particular series that will close all this series uh, of webinars. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. See you soon. Thank you, Albert. And thank you for all assistance. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.